Hello, I'm Mick Garrison. I'd like to welcome you once again to the Fantasy Film Festival. Today's feature is It Lives Again, a sequel to a bit of a classic horror film, It's Alive. Uh, we've had a little bit of a scheduling problem. Rick Baker will not be with us right now, but instead we have the writer, producer, and director of the film, all in one man, Larry Cohen. Larry, nice to have you here well, with us. Oh, it's nice to be here. Now, you started out originally working in television. I guess The Defenders was the first thing uh, you were involved in in that way, as a writer, right? Yeah, I began writing television when I was in college, and, and uh, I wrote about three years of The Defenders courtroom shows. You also created uh, Branded, I believe, and even more suitable for our purposes, The Invaders, with the Fifth Little Finger Invaders. Yeah, people. Roy Thinnis, The Invaders on ABC Television. Right. How did that all come together? Well, uh, I had always wanted to do that particular show, and that was basically uh, inspired, I guess, by the Invasion of the Body Snatchers uh, uh, idea, concept, which I had seen when it came out as a B-movie, obscurely played in New York many, many years ago, and uh, the idea of aliens on Earth in human form uh, I thought would be a good format for a television uh, program. And also, I'd write, I'd been writing The Defenders, and was very involved in political drama, and it seemed to me that uh, using aliens who had infiltrated our society was a way of dramatizing the fixation of communist infiltration of the United States and the paranoia that was spreading across the country and was just coming to an end uh, about uh, uh, communists everywhere in the government and everywhere in show business and in the motion picture industry. And we could somehow treat that uh, in television by uh, doing a show like The Invaders. And, uh, they're in your neighborhood. They're in your neighborhood. And of course, that was right, it came on right after the tail end of the blacklist. You still had to clear the names of actors with the networks up until a few years before. I remember during the Defenders period, uh, names of actors had to still be cleared at the networks to know that they were uh, approved and they could still, they could still be employed. Mm. Even Branded, which was a Western series, was about a, uh, a cavalry officer who was court-martialed uh, out of the service and humiliated and stripped of his rank and uh, in effect blacklisted. And as he traveled through the West, his reputation prevented him from getting jobs and preventing him from getting uh, 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 a place that he could permanently live. And uh, I remember Chuck Connors, who was the actor who was playing it, was uh, sitting with me one day during the first season of the show and I, and, and I started to explain to him what really had made me write this show in the first place, that he was actually playing a show about a blacklisted man. I think I told him the wrong thing because his political persuasion lay in the other direction. And <laughs> we never spoke again, and I was shortly removed from the program. Oh, is that? And uh, other writers came and took over the show. Well, all of your projects have a little bit of the feeling of the outsider, the outcast, anyway. Um, what basically drew you into the genre? Most of your theatrical features are science fiction horror oriented. Uh, are you particularly enamored of that field? Not really. Uh, some of them have been science fiction or, uh, or horror oriented, but they're really, as you say, films about the outsider, uh, the, the, the person who doesn't fit in, the outcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, don't, I don't see the, the It's Alive series of the two films being that different really in genre from the Elephant Man kind of concept mm -hmm. of, the, of the freak or the unusual person or the person who can't be accepted. The first picture I made, which was not widely distributed, was called Bone with Yafet Kodo as a black man. Mm -hmm. And it dealt with the black man's role in the white man's eyes as sort of a monster figure, a fearful figure, you know, uh, that uh, uh, a certain kind of black man who, be, who represents a sexual and physical threat to the white man. Uh, even though he's not even armed, his very presence on the street uh, makes a certain uh, white person, a certain type of white person, uh, uh, walk a little further to the right or get out of the way because he symbolizes something to them as a threat. So that's what the first picture was about. And then the uh, It's Alive films were about uh, uh, a mutation, a different kind of person being born that might be uh, 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 an indication of what the future might bring to our society and uh, the fear that our society has of, of that kind of person, somebody different. All the films have, uh, have had that uh, kind of approach. The J. Edgar Hoover picture was about a, a man who was different very closed and uh, uptight and, and, unto and, 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 and unto himself, didn't fit in with anybody, always felt an outcast, always felt uh, strange and odd. And so he, instead of becoming one of the people, he became uh, a super figure, an outside figure who eavesdropped and blackmailed and peeked through the keyholes 
but never participated in life, mm -hmm. but made judgments and tried to control the people from the outside. So he never was, and people have called that a political monster film. Right. And a uh, human monster. A human monster. Well, let's talk a little about the whole genesis of the It's Alive uh, story. Uh, how did that come together? It's like an hour and a half commercial for Planned Parenthood in a way. Well, I guess I got that idea for that story many, many years ago. I think I was in high school or something when I first came up with the story idea. Uh, and then uh, I had it in my head for years and told it to people. People were interested, but I had never written it down and made a screenplay out of it. I guess we ought to say that the story concerns a woman who gives birth to a genetic mutation, a baby monster, which goes around killing people. Which, in its own self-defense, actually, right. uh, kills. In the first film, it kills uh, the doctor who delivers it. And and, uh, and the and the and story a room full of order. And yeah, and the story in, in the story revolves the uh, father of the child's attempt to uh, turn the responsibility away from himself, to deny the parenthood of the child, and to uh, uh, participate in its destruction. And finally, uh, upon facing the infant himself and seeing it and having the power to kill it, he realizes that it is his child. He uh, he he accepts its humanness. He sees the part of it that is human in himself, and uh, he tries in the end to protect the child, and he feels love for it. And it's a very moving scene, which was filmed in the, in the storm drains of Los Angeles, where he picks the right. child up in his arms, and the tears stream down his face, and he realizes that this is his child, and he does love it. And remember, in the first film, we hardly ever showed the baby. Right. It was a monster film in which the monster was not seen. It was rather felt through well, the we spoke. Uh, for a magazine article about this, and uh, you had an interesting theory about the bigger the monster, the less frightening it is, and the more you see of a monster. Well, I think that smaller things are somehow more frightening to us in real life. I mean, uh, uh, people are afraid of a mouse or an insect, a roach or something. Sometimes it will drive people into a frenzy of terror. Uh, small things are the things that we fear that we come in contact with the most. And uh, there are many gags in an It's Alive type picture as well as doing a serious film with emotion, you also, you also do gags, you do uh, kind of black humor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and part of the black humor was to take the most innocent image of all, which is an infant, and uh, by some sort of skill, turning that into an object of terror. So what would be the least frightening thing in the world? Would it be a baby. newborn baby? And let's take it now and turn it into an object of terror. And how do we do that? Well, we don't show it. We do it with sound effects, we do it with shadows, we do it with innuendo, we do it with point of view shots of the camera. And, and, and actually, this picture was made, uh, the first It's Alive picture was made before Jaws. Right. And many of the devices that we used in uh, It's Alive were, were also used by Spielberg in Jaws, the point of view from the baby, uh, the music, which only comes in whenever the baby appears, Bernard Herrmann's music, which uh, is the leitmotif of the, of the infant. Right. Uh, We've been imitated quite a few times since then, you know, by Frankenheimer in that picture that he the made, prophecy, The Prophecy, right. where he took the entire opening sequence from It's Alive and, and redid it with the flashlights going through the dark. Right. There's another similar film, The Devil Within Her. Uh, yeah, that was, was, that, was British made. that was made uh, after It's Alive came out as an imitation another of Another killer baby. Yeah. Film. And people have even told me that in The Alien, the creature that comes out of uh, right. John Hurt's chest, uh, bears a striking similarity to the It's Alive <laughs> baby. In, in a, well, the... Uh, most unique thing about the film was it was probably the first monster movie in which the the object of terror is birthed by normal human adults. Certainly, but not in fiction. You can go all the way back to Greek mythology to uh, uh, normal human beings giving birth to monsters. Right. And every culture, uh, every society, whether you go to Hindu or uh, even American Indian culture, there's always the stories and legends of the human person who gives birth to the monster. Uh, as if uh, every culture believes that inside us is some kind of monster waiting to get out, right. or a symbolic monster waiting to get out, or some kind of demon waiting to get out. So this is a modern Jekyll and Hyde, in a way. Yeah, but in, but in, in my estimation, the, 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 the monster, as they call it in this film, is really an innocent. Mm -hmm. It's committed no wrong, it's just different. It, uh, it may be uh, that it's the next step in evolution, because that's the only thing that can survive in a world that's going to be... Uh, full of pollution and probably radiation 
and uh, that somehow nature is creating a being that can survive in the kind of world that we are creating for ourselves. So a little Darwin in the film, too. Yeah, I mean, there's, I took the picture seriously on that level. On the entertainment level, we try to make a good thriller somewhat in the style of the Val Luton pictures mm -hmm. at RKO back in the 40s, where he worked on low budgets and created right. the monsters by uh, psychological, psychological manipulation of mm -hmm. the audience rather than by uh, uh, building uh, gigantic uh, robots or uh, building gigantic uh, models, but rather but uh, But in the sequel, It Lives Again, which we'll be seeing in a moment, um, you, there are three baby monsters, and you see them much more clearly. Uh, why was that choice made? Well, we made the first picture in which we didn't show the monster at all for any intents and purposes. I think you may have... Fleetingly. Yeah, yeah, 15 seconds or something in the entire 90-some minutes of, of actual monster. We shot a lot of stuff. But it was my decision to show less and less, and uh, and and we got increased amount of suspense in direct proportion to the less that we showed the monster, the expectation. Right. I think people uh, uh, fear what they fear to see. You know, the fear of being afraid is e is the greatest fear of all. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the second time around, however, we felt we we're going to ask everybody to come out and pay four dollars and fifty cents again to come back and see the, a variation of the same theme. So we had to give them more monster. And in retrospect, that may have been a mistake. Uh, I think perhaps the second picture is not as frightening as the first picture. In many ways, I think it's better in, 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 in some elements. Uh, there are some wonderful acting scenes. There's some very good performances. Frederick Forrest, Kathleen Lloyd, and John Marley, John Ryan, good people, wonderful mm -hmm. actors, uh, who really brought a reality to it. And, uh, and I think it was a good idea to tell some more of the story. Now, John Ryan tells me that uh, this was originally intended as a trilogy. Is that true? Will there be a third It's Alive Goes to College, as Rick Baker says? Or? Well, now that Ronald Reagan's not available, <laughs> uh, uh, I had an idea for a third picture. The first film was very, very successful at the box office. Uh, the second film did not receive a really good release, and uh, it still may have a further release at, at, at some future time, I hope, with the emergence of Frederick Forrest into a really big star. Sure, The Rose, uh, Apocalypse Now. Yeah, and he has a new picture coming out called Hammett, right. in which he really carries the film and plays Dashiell Hammett, and I think that might carry him forward to real stardom. And then we have a, a film in which he stars, in which he does quite a good job, and that may end up uh, enabling us to get another distribution of this film. Right. And uh, if this does happen, and we have uh, a successful release of this picture that you're going to see tonight, uh, then uh, it would be possible to make a third film. We're fast running out of time. I just got the one-minute signal. Uh, so let's talk a little about your new film, Full Moon High. There are a lot of werewolf movies coming out. Uh, yours, basically, this is your first comedy, am I right? Well, the first picture I made with, uh, with Yafit Toto was Bone a comedy. Was a uh, Jimmy Berlin and Yafit Toto, it was a comedy, a black comedy. Mm -hmm. In a way, a picture about a werewolf is, is, a, is a black comedy in, it, in itself. Uh, uh, this is a comedy about a teenager played by Adam Arkin who uh, turns into a werewolf and leaves home and uh, travels the world and comes back 20 years later to his hometown where he, of course, has not aged because being a werewolf, he stays young. All right. But all his friends who he went to high school with have all become middle-aged and older people. They've changed, actually, too. They've changed, just like he's changed into a werewolf, they change into old people. They become monsters, in a way. Well, I look forward to yeah. seeing we that. We have we Alan Arkin as, as a psychiatrist who tries oh, to son cure and, uh, father. and the father and son work very well together, and Ed McMahon's in it, and a wonderful cast of comedians. Uh, so uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a ball to make, and a, it should be out, I think, April or May from Filmways. Great. That sounds terrific. Well, we've been talking to Larry Cohen, writer, producer, and director of It's Alive and It Lives Again. And we'll be seeing you soon on the Fantasy Film Festival. Thanks for joining us, and thank you. Larry. Thank you. Pleasure.